Okay, we just got down in the creek. Finally a beautiful day that we can get out and do some creek walking. The only question is which way do we want to go? Which way do you want to go, baby? Left or right? The easiest way for me to walk. It would be to the right. Let's go. Okay, we've been walking down this creek about five minutes. And I've already come up. Come up on the first point. And there it is right there. Hold this stick for me, baby. Let me pull this up out here. See it? Yep. Well, it's an old crude one. Get you some light here. Looks like the tips broke off of it. Or is it the way it's made? Well, no, it's the way it's made. It's just well used. All right. Good job, baby. Thank you, baby. It's washed down good. Look, Let's keep going. Out? No, it's not. All right, we're going to keep going. We got a long way to go. This water is so cold. It was quite a shock stepped into this water. We should have wore some rubber boots, but we usually don't mess with those. As soon as you get water in them, you're done for the day. So, But our feet finally are starting to get numb. And we have a long way to walk. So the homeowner, the landowner that uh, gives us permission to walk this creek, unfortunately, as you can see, he's He's taking up all the trees along both sides of the creek. He's just taking them out. So there's not many, uh, not many animals that, we, that you see in this creek. Maybe a deer every now and then. We have to walk all the way to that tree line right there. You can see that. To get to the main creek and the woods. So it's a long way to go. I don't know if we'll make it, but we're going to try. Okay, I'm back again. You can see Letitia still quite a bit behind me. And I've just walked up on, I think, number three. She's going to be so upset she hasn't found anything yet. Can you guys see that? Looks like a little, a little blade. There it is. Yes, it looks like a little cob's blade. Nicely beveled. And it's whole. Nice. I'll definitely take it. Found another one, baby. Number three. I'll show it to you when you catch up with me. Okay, I don't know what you said, but okay. Yeah, still got a long ways to go before we get to the tree line. So, we're carrying on. We're having a great day, great day. Glad we.
came out here. Okay, we're about halfway to the tree line. Luckily, we've had a lot of berms to walk on, so our feet got a chance to warm up. I'm on this huge berm now, waiting for Letitia to catch up with me. I found this little nutting stone here. I don't know if you can see that. A lot of people don't know what these were used for. But simply they were used to sharpen their bone tools like awls and such like that. They were not used to crack walnuts or whatever. She's slowly coming up here. So first time we walked this creek and got permission to walk it. Uh, there was four or five of us walking down it and we walked from the bridge all the way down to that tree line and we didn't find anything and we, we all said oh this is a terrible creek let's just go ahead and scratch this one off the map and on our way back we found five arrowheads that we'd walked over so needless to say we've been coming back ever since so have you have you had any luck baby no, no luck no, yeah you think you might want to turn around and go downstream right okay well we can do that Whatever. I found three already. You're a little sore at me for that one, but I know. Now, you can't deny that so many times, I don't know how many times we've come creep walking, and you found two or three points, and I found none. So, so don't be too mad at me, okay? Today? On your part, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, there was, a matter of fact, it was like four months that we came, and I didn't find anything, and you found some every time. And, so, no complaints, okay? Sorry. No complaints for me? Alright. Okay, we're back. Just walking a little bit more before I turn around. Getting very tired. I haven't found anything for a while. Neither one of us. I don't even know where he's at. Yeah, he's gone. <laughs> Down there, around that curve somewhere. So, I think I'm going to walk this little area right here. This is the type of rock I was telling you I love to look in so much. Water's not very deep. Oh my gosh looky there and that's why baby i found something oh my goodness i don't know if you can see that oh baby and he's gone i have no idea where he's at oh my goodness i hope you can see it guys Oh, please be whole, please be whole. Oh. Oh. Oh my gosh. I found a smuggler. Oh. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Lord, forgive me for that. Oh my gosh. That is a smoker. Oh. And he's gone. He didn't even get to see it. Oh, that's what I love coming up from behind usually. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Ah, I'm gonna wash it off. I'm sorry, guys. Wow.
Oh, I'm shaking like a leaf. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Really? It is a smoker. Oh, Lord, baby, it's beautiful. Wow. I think she's found something good way back here. I hope so. Really? A smoker? Oh, wow. That was way up there, too. I told you, I wasn't walking your side of the creek. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. I was just telling wow. the guys how I loved walking in this water right here because it's perfect. Oh. oh, my goodness, baby. That's a... I think that's a Buck Creek. Did you take a picture of it uh, oh, no, I didn't. in C2? I have it on camera. I was wow. just telling everybody how I loved walking this kind of water. I was honestly getting ready to turn around. That's a smoker. Oh, let me get a picture of it. Oh, I wish I'd got it before I pulled it out there. Wow. Oh, oh. wow. I was just walking along. It's just Dude, beautiful that point. That was actually live action. Beautiful oh color. Gosh. I got it in live action. I love it. Wow. Good job, honey. I'm sorry. All right. I think we should keep going, don't you? <laughs> I've only found one piece of flint, but uh, three points. And Letitia's first point is better than all three of mine put together. Good job, honey. All right. Let's keep going. There you go. I'm going to show you this. Live action. All right, guys. We made it to the, uh, the, end, the end of this little feeder creek. It's the mouth of the big creek and turned around. It's getting late. And we need to get back to the car before dark. But I walked up on this. Right here. Let's see what we got here. Let's see if it's whole. Oh, that's a pretty one. Yeah. I think it's it's whole. Maybe one nick off the edge. It's pretty. Get off there. What is that? I don't know, but it's it's old and pretty crude though. And look, there's the fire marks. So this might be right. a campsite right here. Might want to take a few minutes and scratch this a little better. Yeah, let's do that. Good okay, job, guys. Man. Thank you, honey. So we'll, uh, we still got a long way to walk on our way back. So thanks for. Thanks for coming creaking, creaking with us today. Uh, we really, really love creek walking like this and picking these points up. So you guys have a great day. Okay, everyone, I'm here at LBL with my good friend, Martin Groves. And Martin's got a little story to tell everyone. Martin, why don't you start by telling everybody a little bit about yourself. I guess that uh, that's probably one of the hardest questions that, that, that I get asked because it's hard to talk about my own self. 
Right. Uh, I have that problem too. It's 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 kind of hard because no matter how you put it out, sometimes it sounds like a guy or a girl is is kind of bragging on oneself, and that's really not who I am. But here it goes. Uh, basically, I was raised in a farm world where I grew up on the farm, and uh, we raised uh, pigs and cows and. I was raised in the woods all my life. From the time I was a small boy, we would be in the woods and uh, we would uh, watch all of our animals, especially our cows, when they'd go calfing. And why I tell you this is to let you know that I'm very accustomed to being in the woods. I mean, that was that was my that was my world to be with my father and, and siblings, cousins, and stuff, and be out in the woods. After I grew up. Uh, I never really wanted to be anything but a farmer, but for whatever reason, fate changed my world and I became a police officer. So from the time I was 18 years of age, I was in law enforcement. And for my 21st birthday, I was given a, my full commission with a badge and a gun from a city mayor. And I've been a police, police officer all my adult life. In the year of 1993, I had been a police officer uh, for many a years, and you could say I was past my rookie days and past the stage of being uh, what we would call the young ones that come in, you know, just young rookies. And I was a very seasoned officer and had been trained uh, for many hours. I have, I have so many thousands of hours of training under my belt. And, I, I could tell you everything that I've done and how they've trained me and I, you know I've been trained everything from simple investigating accidents, fatality accidents to the most complex homicide cases and I've worked on serial serial murder cases. I've been to every kind of homicide school you could ever imagine. Counterterrorism, terrorism, sniper schools, counter sniper. Um, you name it and if I kept talking about myself it, it really wouldn't even sound good it's just thousands of hours of police training so in 1993 after a, a very long winter and spring a friend of mine at work we had decided we needed some downtime and we wanted to get away from the life of police officers and uh, come in to land between the lakes and take some downtime and de-stress and go go do a little bit of hunting and it's something that he and I had done a lot. We had hunted and fished together for a few years and we both had that lifestyle. So we came into the park thinking that we were going to have a nice little turkey hunt and possibly just hang out around the campfire and kind of play Jeremiah Johnson or Daniel Boone and just have a good time and uh, so we come into the park and on a Friday and we found us a nice little spot out in the, out in the middle of the woods and we'd already been we'd already been told where there was some food plots that had been left over from the previous year to find some turkeys and search for wildlife and we thought we had a sort of really good camp spot. And it really was a Jim Dandy camp spot. We had a granite wall or rock wall behind us that kind of shielded us from, from wind. And we thought we were in a really good secure area. We'd come off the trace and come off for a few miles that we felt like that we wouldn't have any contact with any other hunters or any other humans. And um, it was just a beautiful spot. So we decided to get our tent up and tarp and set up the campsite. And we settled in. It was starting to get dark the first night. And we kicked back and went to sleep pretty early and fell asleep. And it had rained during the night. And we had a late morning in the camp that, that day. It was still raining early morning hours and we felt like we probably wouldn't have enough uh, real good morning hunt. We knew that the turkeys would stay on their roost for some time and not come out for a while. And 
we stayed in and then finally it had stopped raining that morning and we just decided to get out and do this little scouting and hunt and we went our separate ways and we said goodbye to one another and I went in one direction and my hunting partner he decided to go in one direction and scout a field out where an old cornfield was and I decided I wanted to go up and hit the ridges that come up from around our camp and I knew that the trails were pretty well marked and I knew how to get in and out of camp that night and uh, so I traced off through the woods and got pretty deep into the woods away from the camp and had been gone all up through the morning midday and I hadn't spotted a lot of sign of turkey I had heard some turkeys and I'd heard some gobbles and, and uh, at one point I had seen a, a hen, but didn't have any luck seeing gobblers, so I just continued walking and tracing through the woods and following a really good game trail. As the day progressed on and the late evening came, uh, it was in the afternoon, I decided to take a break and I came out of the woods and I was headed basically uh, in an eastern direction towards where I knew that the trace was just a few miles away from me here. And I sat down on the edge of a log and next to the edge of a field, and there was an old, a very old logging road beside of me. And I'd been there a few minutes just sitting, having a little drink of water and nipping on something as a snack when I heard a vehicle approach me. And it was coming up out of the woods, and it was just a, a older model vehicle, and it had a lone person in it, one occupant, and I knew by his camouflage that was another hunter he had spotted me and he decided to pull up and get closer and he wanted to talk to me and you know hunters have a certain camaraderie and we decided to talk for a few minutes well it turns out the individual I was speaking with uh, he he actually was from Kentucky and he was a firefighter and uh, we joked and kidded one another for quite a few moments because I was a policeman and he was a firefighter. And anybody that's ever been a policeman or a firefighter understand there's always been a rivalry between the two. So we were kidding and cutting up with each other. I've never met a police officer that did not want to be a fireman or a fireman that didn't want to be a policeman. So we talked a little bit. And he kind of ribbed me some about the fact that I was hunting with a shotgun and. He let me know that uh, real men hunt, <laughs> hunted with a bow and arrow. And uh, I hadn't had a lot of contact with folks that turkey hunted with bows yet. And uh, he let me know he was pretty good. And he did show me and I got to handle his, his bow and play with it for a few moments and tried to shoot a little something with it. And uh, we talked for 30 to 45 minutes. And as we decided to part, he was going to go his separate way and he invited me to come visit his camp if I wanted to and I told him where my camp was and uh, the young man let me know that uh, before he left he said I, I really shouldn't say anything but just to let you guys know that you might want to keep your fire up at night time I've had some issues with something circling my camp at night time he said I probably shouldn't say nothing and it, it probably doesn't mean anything but it was important to let me know that I should kind of watch my camp at night because something had been bothering him and whatever that it was it would not get close enough in the firelight to allow him to see it but it worried the man he was scared we parted Said, said our goodbyes and he drove off in his little truck and I, I went my opposite direction and it was getting pretty dark and uh, I thought about the individual for a few minutes and I had zero idea that that of the possibility that at that time I had no reason to think anything about my, my parting from it but later on I would find out that I, I very possibly was the last man to have seen this gentleman alive. And that's, that's always haunted me and bothered me. And uh, so I, I, I left from the meeting and 
decided to head back towards camp because it was late evening and I had walked miles throughout the day through these trails and just following ridges. But, you know, I'm an old guy now. I was young in those days and going through the trees and the woods and the brambles and stuff, it didn't bother me, you know, going anywhere from seven to 10 miles a day on a turkey hunt was nothing. So I started to head back to my camp and uh, I had been in the woods for quite a few minutes and far enough away that I knew that the person I'd spoke to was nowhere around me. He was long gone. I'd heard his truck drive off and we're talking about another hour had transpired or more and there was no way to hear any vehicles and I was deep, deep woods. And uh, the difference in the walk from the early morning and coming through and going in the afternoon, I noticed that there was some some insect chatter and there was a lot of noise in the woods, you know, birds and such. This was in the late afternoon and normal for a hunter was that you would hear things because of the night, night noises and the night insects and such. The first thing that caught my mind and eyes were the fact that it was so quiet in the woods. And that was kind of abnormal, but I didn't pay any attention to it. I had been in the woods for quite a spell when I heard some noises that was kind of took me by surprise that was just totally did not belong in the woods. And there was, I knew for a fact that in the area where I was at, there was no other uh, buildings, there was no roads to be had close enough to me. And uh, I heard a metallic sound in the woods that sounded different than any noise I'd ever heard before in any woods. And it, it was, it startled me at first. And, and I guess being young and being overconfident in myself, I didn't pay any attention, but there was a sharp metallic noise that sounded as if there was something opening and closing like a, a metal scraping across a concrete floor maybe or maybe the sound of somebody slamming metal upon on something and uh, I should have paid more attention but I did not at that time. I continued walking toward the area of my camp and I knew I had quite a ways to go and as I'm walking, one of the first distinct noises I heard was a very loud and very sharp, shrill whistle. It was a whistle that I knew had not come from another hunter, but could have been a mechanical whistle, like something you would use to call dogs with, but it was a sharp and shrill whistle. And uh, again, I did not pay any attention to that. I just kept walking. And uh, as I continued my walk, it wasn't very long after the whistle that I caught some movement in the woods with me. Now I'm, I'm in an area where the ridge was very high and I had the game trail that I walked on. There was a large ridge that was to the right of me uh, that was in my right eye and I saw out of my peripheral vision movement and uh, at first I didn't know what to make of it so we I was walking back to the camp and after the uh, I was catching out of my peripheral vision movement in in the ridge above me and it was kind of a funny thing because uh, it, it was almost as if whatever was moving on the ridge kept just enough distance that kept me from uh, from getting a really good close look at whatever that it was. And as I walked, I could tell that it was at least at least three to four objects, and I could tell that it was something that was moving on four legs. But I, after that, I just there was no way to really see it. It was getting, it was getting, it was, it was getting dusk, and uh, but I kept walking through the woods, and 
at some point I had made a decision that whatever this whatever this group uh, whether if it was coyotes or whatever that it was I had made a decision at some point that I was going to walk and all of a sudden I was just going to stop and freeze and that's I think about the time that the, that the real activity began to speed up so I got that frame of mind and I kind of sped up for 10 to 20 feet and I just locked down man I just froze and stopped and it immediately within a quarter second half second I can't tell you whatever was moving on the ridge it froze that's when I kind of got bothered I was disturbed at that because I knew I've been in the woods I was an experienced hunter been in the woods all my life. I thought I was a pretty good person to, to uh, I hunted everything. Nothing, nothing stops when you stops. If, if it was coyotes, they would have continued running. And I've seen groups of coyotes in land between the lakes, whether it be 20, 25 or greater, that many coyotes running together in a pack. So when I stopped, and it stopped, I made a decision that I always walked with my shotgun with nothing in the tube, nothing in the barrel of the shotgun. I always kept it loaded, but where I would have to manually pump around into the chamber of the gun. That's when I made the decision to load my gun. I loaded my, my shotgun and I began to watch around me. At some point after that, when I started walking, the objects began to follow me again. That's when I heard a whistle one more time. I heard a real shrill whistle and it was ahead of me this time. The other, the other whistles I'd heard was directly behind me. This time there was a whistle that was in front of me and I knew at that point that this was not a human but in the same token the same thought there was part of me that said okay maybe this a hunter maybe he's running his dogs uh, this is spring of the year it could be that I've got a coon hunter out in the woods with me that's just running his dogs so I wrote it off kept walking and I heard the metallic noise once more except this time it was in the front of me instead of behind me just like the whistles I heard the bang or the clamper of a metal noise and at first it was kind of confusing to me was this since I was getting closer to my camp was this possibly my my camp mate my hunting partner I just didn't know what to think of it, but the distinct difference this time was the fact that it was in front of me, and that's when I caught movement directly in front of me. No more than a couple hundred yards at the very most, there was something beside of the tree, and there was a very large tree in front of me. And I noticed what I thought was a man that was a very tall man, a very large individual. And I thought that it was a hunter wearing a ghillie suit. And um, that's the only thing that I could accept in my mind at that time, was that this was a hunter in a ghillie suit. These are his dogs, must be smart dogs, but they were dogs. That's when I got a little frightened, a little even more. My level of, of, of being more aware that there's something just was not right. At this point, I noticed that whatever was following me through the woods on the right side 
was getting closer and it seemed to be getting uh, a little more the cautious level of whatever was was following me they began to get closer At the same time that i'm watching these animals and i'm looking in front of me and i've seen what is in front of me all of a sudden it's not there anymore and i didn't know if it stepped behind the tree i didn't know what had happened I'm getting a little freaked out at this point. If it was a hunter, why didn't the person wave, speak, like would be normal? What is this to my right side? So, I, it, you know, I'm making a decision. It's time to get back to camp. And I knew that I was getting closer. And I could smell campfire. I could smell wood smoke. And um, I just simply followed the road, the trace, the animal trace I was following. And it was just a really good, sharp, distinct trail, and I followed it, and I knew if I kept going, I would get to my camp, and I would be safe then, and chalk it all up, write it off, what have you. And uh, as I began to get closer to my camp, uh, I hollered into the camp, and I could see my camp mate. He'd got a pretty good fire going, and the closer I got to camp, I could tell that my my hunting partner, he was, he didn't have a happy look on his face and he looked very stressed. And I immediately began to apologize for being gone so long during the day and and uh, I told him I was sorry that I had been gone for so so many hours. And uh, he, he looked at me and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, Marty, it's not that, it, it's, it's not the fact that You've been gone so long. I was a little bit worried about you, but I knew you could take care of yourself. But he said, I've had some pretty strange things happen to me here while I was hunting today. And uh, we got up around the campfire and we began to talk. And something I haven't discussed a lot, and I've, I've told the story a few times, but there's some things about personal things that you just don't don't speak of but my my hunting partner was pretty rattled and he had told me that he had been harassed the whole time he had been turkey hunting that day and he had been in a field and he felt like that he had seen a hunter in the woods and it the same description that I used when I was in the woods and my thought was a man in a ghillie suit and he repeated that he said that I thought that I saw a very large hunter in the field beside of me and it was wearing a ghillie suit and uh, he had had rocks thrown at him while he was hunting and the one thing that really scared the man was uh, he could not understand I don't think it would be fear maybe it was a concern but he'd had a corn cob go flying past his head that had it was about half eaten and the other half was had corn on it and he told me he said there's no way that a, that a man could throw a corn cob from the distance it had to have came from with such strength because it doesn't weigh anything and he said this corn cob come flying out of the woods and whizzed by his head with great force and he looked up and he couldn't see what had thrown it and he couldn't see anybody and that, that disturbed my, my, my partner. That, that, that kind of flipped him out a little bit. And then he began to tell me that he had heard whistles. And he, in fact, at one point, had heard a metal noise that came from the trail where I was from. And he had heard all these things and didn't know what to think of it. And to be honest, he didn't feel like that it was, it, it was me that made the noise. He felt like that it had to be someone in the woods with him so this is uh it's it's dark and we're discussing the day's events and it is extremely dark and at lbl just like where we're sitting at tonight in the darkness with a fire glow we had a small fire and we had a lantern going and we had a little never forget it was a little small red kerosene lantern and it maybe would have a, a glow of just a few feet that circle around it that would give us a little extra sight. 
And as we're sitting around, standing, getting up, moving around, Harry and I both seen something kind of to the side of us. And this is where sometimes I can tell the story and I can laugh about it. And this is sometimes when I get pretty freaked out and I sometimes even cry. But what what then began to occur was a series of events that I know I not I cannot understand nor can I offer any explanation as to what happened. We saw something beside of the trees beside of us within just a few yards that to me appeared to be a man standing behind of a tree smoking a cigarette and it glowed like a little red ember like the end of a cigarette glows when you when you suck in and, and you're getting tobacco and that little cigarette and you know I can look back now and I know exactly what it was but at that time I, I just I felt like that there was a man behind the tree and that uh, he was watching us in the camp. Harry saw it, I saw it, and we began to talk and kind of whisper among ourselves. And I told him, I said, hey man, there's, there's somebody over there. And he said, I see it too, Marty. And while we're standing in there talking and I'm watching this go from one side of the tree and to the other side of the tree, and this, this isn't a small tree, this is a huge tree. What I, what I perceived at the time to be a large oak, possibly a red oak tree. And uh, I'm watching there, and then we're beginning above the cliff above us. We're getting little pieces of wood falling off. There was not a lot of wind, so it couldn't be that there was branches being blown by the wind and falling off, and it was just small things at first. And in the beginning, I didn't pay any attention to the wood, to the little bitty limbs and stuff, but then a bigger limb came. And as we're looking around and I'm seeing this, at some point, I guess my alpha male police officer uh, attitude or, or personality came out and I kind of was getting pretty, pretty boisterous. And as we're standing there at some point, we get a large rock come off the top that I only can describe to you as 30 to a 50 pound rock and it didn't go clampering down the sides like it fell. It was hurled off above us. Didn't hit anything coming down. It didn't strike or roll. It came straight down like somebody threw a ball and it landed closer to him than me but it was kind of like distal to both of us. And that's when I screamed. And I said, hey, man, this ain't cool. You guys coming into man's camp at night. I know that I shouted some things I probably shouldn't have said, but I was pretty worked up. And um, I went into a kind of a stance that, you know, this is our camp, man, and you're not going to come in here and run us out. We both had the mentality at this point that this was our campfire. This was our camp. We were going to stay here. And if these were hunters, you know, they just up up the creek, man, because we, we're staying here. And uh, that is about the time that I caught some movement and some noise. What takes place next is just, just as terrifying to me as it is me sitting here tonight, I'm just almost as terrified speaking about it as I was the night that it took place. I caught, I caught movement from the same trail that I had walked in on and I could tell that somebody was coming down the trail. And I could, I could almost feel presence of someone coming but it stayed out of the my vision to where that I could not see what was coming. And as I'm looking in that direction, that is when a very intense 
growl began to be heard coming from the tree section where we had seen these glowing these glowing eyes or glowing embers <laughs> and uh it was an intense reverberation in my chest the ground below my feet seemed to be almost electrified and the noise began to come in and it permeated my my heart my breathing my ears were affected from this and i began to lose control of my breath and of my breathing uh, it was a it is something that i can't i can't describe and i cannot give you any explanation other than i can report what i see what i hear and what i know what i know and that's all i've done as as a police officer and This incredible intenseness and feeling of evil came over me in a sheer panic and dread. I'm losing my breath. I've been in, in, in fighting situations where you're fighting for life or death, and I began to get that feeling, and you begin to get you speed up, Everything beside of you comes into your heart and everything and you begin to panic And I could not move I was frozen in place. I couldn't move. I couldn't move backwards. I couldn't turn It was almost as if I was frozen and I began to get tunnel vision It affected my hearing and everything sounds like you're in a barrel and that's when I heard something coming from the trail it came on in and I when I looked up I saw something in the glow of the lantern and in the fire that was going that it did not belong it could not it, 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 it could not exist what I was seeing it just could not my eyes could not accept what I saw and as it began to come closer it was bipedal it looked like a wolf it looked like a man it was black in color with gray going with it and with the pitchest black eyes you could make it, it just the eyes of this that I was seeing was the depths of evil that I can only you just can't imagine what I was seeing and this thing came forward and as it got closer it it exposed its teeth i could see canine a snout i could see its teeth and it appeared to me that this animal this beast whatever depths of hell it came from it grinned at me and i felt like i felt like it was reading my thoughts i felt like that it it absolutely could could read everything and it to, to sit back and look now and I think about it, it was like it was feeding off my fear. And it was grinning at me because I was in such a fear and a state of shock. <clears throat> it had to take a moment. So I began, the only thing that I could think of and that was to pray. I felt like at that point, whatever this thing was, it was going to kill us both. It was going to, it was going to eat us. It was going to kill us. And uh, I began to pray, and I and, I, and I, I will never forget. I began to pray in my mind first. The shepherd's David's prayer, and the Lord is my shepherd. And I just, I began to pray, and the more I prayed inside of my head, it seemed like my fear had dissipated just a little piece at a time just a step by step or an inch by inch i began to pray and as i began to pray i, I remember getting to the point where it was no longer in my head i was communicating and i was verbally saying my prayer and as i did i could still see this thing and it had frozen it was staring at me but now it was no longer grinning but it was still standing there 
that's when I felt some movement, some control. Now my breathing is still erratic and I'm still, I'm still in whatever kind of state of shock that I'm in, but I moved. And when I moved the first, my first instinct was to take my right hand and I moved down and my right hand went straight to my service weapon that I was wearing. And I withdrew my service weapon and I pointed it in the direction of, uh, of this beast. And I looked in the direction of the beast. And what it told me was what I was looking at, that this was a very intelligent creature. Because when I pointed my firearm at this beast, it froze. And it backed up. It took steps backwards. And as I pointed my weapon, I began to get a little easement. But you have to understand, at that point, I'm, my mind is telling me that if I squeeze the trigger of my firearm, that I have to account for every round that comes out the end of my barrel. What am I shooting at? What am I seeing? Am I about to fire a gun that could be someone dressed up? All these things going through my mind. But when I lowered my firearm, this beast moved forward and, and began to come towards my direction. And that's when I fired my firearm twice. And I put two rounds in its direction. And in the blink of an eye, at the same time I fired, it dissipates in front of me. I don't know if it disappears like poof or if it goes up the side of the cliff because I hear noise instantly, it, it doesn't make sense. It's like millisecond and it's up the cliff. And there's no way that a man or beast could go up the cliff in, in that brief period of time. So I got noise up above me. I've got noise behind me. And at the same time I have discharged my firearm, my hunting partner, discharges a double barrel shotgun in the direction of the oak tree where these glowing eyes were. I didn't hear any noise after I fired from what I shot at, but when Harry discharged his double barrel shotgun, we heard a scream, a hideous scream. I heard the thud from it. My partner struck something. And it began to scream, and it was a hideous noise. It, it, it was almost as if you had uh, you had shot a wild animal, and it was just it, it only only thing it did was make it mad. When this takes place behind me, Harry has grabbed some stuff off the ground, and he's took off running. And I realized that my partner's going for his pickup truck. I'm trying to look up above me. I don't know what's over the side of me. I'm trying to cover us both. I've got my handgun out. I began to jot back to the truck where the truck was. I hear the truck door open. He jumps in, fires up the pickup truck. I'm jumping up, get up into the back end of the pickup truck. I'm hanging on up top to the rack. And uh, he's beginning to get everything fired up and he throws his truck up and drive, but it won't go anywhere. And I, I had remembered that when we parked the truck, he put the emergency brake on. So I'm banging on top of the cab, hit the brake, hit the brake. Um, I'm, I'm pretty upset, as you can imagine. That's when his headlights come on. And when his headlights come on and it will shine directly in the field beside of us, that's when it lit up the entire field with his headlamps. And I saw what I had seen earlier that day. And I realized that I had not seen a hunter in the field. I realized that I was looking at something that was different that was in our camp. And I was looking straight out at two creatures in the woods, the edge of the field, that are what we would refer to as, as the hairy man or two Bigfoot. One was standing and the other one had fell down when the lights had hit and it hit the ground and it was like on a spider crawl like it was ready to pounce and jump 
but the one that was standing was looking directly at us with no fear whatsoever. I'm looking at this. I'm, I'm looking behind me. I got something next to our camp running through the camp. Harry gets the truck going. We're, we're coming out of there and we've got to cross a creek. We've got to jump through the fields. It, it's just an entirely chaos situation. And as he's pulling off, I'm seeing the two Bigfoot in the field. And then I'm seeing whatever was in our camp through the firelight, through the glow of the headlamps. And I'm in the back end and, and the, the brake lights were the running lamps of the back. So I'm seeing all this stuff at one time. And in the camp, these things are coming through the camp and they're destroying the camp. They, they are ripping up the tent. They're throwing stuff, and it's just, it's just, it's like a horror film being played out in front of me. We mass exit, get the heck out of Dodge, and we get off onto the main trace road, and my partner is driving like Dukes of Hazard, just a race car driver, and getting the heck out of Dodge. I'm banging on the roof because he's done scared me to death that he's going to throw me out of the back end of the pickup truck. I began banging on the back of the, the, the top of the cab and kicking and screaming and hollering. He finally pulls over and lets me up inside the truck. And at this point, my partner, is he's totally just, he's wanting to go home. He's wanting to leave, land between the lakes, leave everything that was in the camp and never come back here. And... I'm screaming to him that we've got to stop at the check station and we've got to tell somebody about what is taking place in our camp and um, report the situation because that's what we've always been trained to do is to tell someone and report. And um, we get to the check station and the check station is closed. It's late at night, check station is closed and he's wanting to exit and go home. I'm able to convince him to spend the night in some uh, open fields a few miles away and to get up the next morning to report what had taken place. The next morning we get up and uh, we see a lot of activity coming down the road in front of us on the main trace. We see a lot of emergency vehicles that we knew because we're policemen we know what we're looking at when we see marked or unmarked units and we see a flurry of activity on the main highway we get up get going we exit out of the field that we'd spent the night of and we drove back to the check station at the edge of the land between the lakes and the dover end of it as we get closer to the check station, we notice that there is a lot of activity there and we discover two, possibly three uh, media TV vans trucks out beside of the, the, the uh, area, out beside of the building and the headquarters. There's people everywhere there's marked and unmarked units sitting in the parking lot and we look at each other and we we decide that something has taken place we don't know what has taken place don't have any idea now i've told the story before but i would like to keep it kind of short concerning what we went through with the authorities there but we had a pretty bad contact with these folks they did not want to believe what we had to say uh, we were held there for, for quite a long time. They had actually contacted my department that I worked for, checked our credentials, looked at our firearms, and we were sternly told that we had seen a rogue bear that had been bothering other campers in the area and that the camper, in fact, had mange and that it was probably disturbed because of its uh, physical condition and that's why it had come into our camp to attack us. Um, I argued with the individual uh, 
without saying their name, we spoke of this individual today who was actually the head of the department. And um, he let us know that, that we could be arrested for actually poaching bear, bear in the park. And at that time, this is 1993, there were no bear that was publicly known uh, to even inhabit the park area. There may have been, but this was not bear. After a good long lengthy talk with this individual and some heated conversations, before he said goodbye to us, he went back in the building to do a couple more things and to retrieve our credentials. Uh, I happened to see some of the folks there that there was an actually three different individuals there from this area that I had known. One was a state trooper that I had been friends with and the other two guys were deputy sheriffs for adjoining counties that were on a canine rescue squad that uh, work this area when there's some type of tragedy. They began to talk to me and they told me the story of why they were actually there and what was going on. The, uh, the chief superintendent there told us that, that there had been something take place in the park. It was none of our business. And one person told us there had been a robbery in the park in one of the campgrounds that night and that uh, we were not to speak to the media and upset the media because there had already been a tragedy within the park. But the uh, trooper and the deputies had told me a different story that it had actually been a lone hunter that had been taken out of his tent during the night and had been predated upon and had been ripped to pieces and killed. And that two hunters that very morning they were going out to go hunting and they stumbled across his camp and had found his body. And they immediately reported it to the authorities and that's that's was the activity that we had seen. Lo and behold, while we're standing there, the actual tow truck had come through and was pulling a pickup truck. And the pickup truck, I noticed, you have to understand me being a police officer I'm very uh, aware of my surroundings and I remember things I can tell you when you stand, what shoe you walk with, how you tie your shoes, what you're wearing. And I noticed that the pickup truck that it was pulling was the actual man that I had met the day before. It had the firefighter tag, it had a Ted, Ted Nugent bow hunter club that he had joined was up in the rear window of the truck and it also had fire paramedic sticker up in it and by looking at the truck I knew immediately the truck because I had paid attention to what he had driven as well not only the characters that was on it and uh, they had told me that that was the man's pickup truck at that point I knew that we had been lied to and the cover-up rogue bear story was was bogus what I call bovine scatology and that uh, that was indeed or who I felt to be the man now since all this has taken place and the years has passed by I have found out and discovered this was the individual that I have spoken to and know the family and know where they live we after all this took place and I discover from the other officers what had taken place the guy came out and spoke to us one more time and told us that we needed to remain silent and that uh, what we had seen and in fact had contact with was this rogue bear and that's when I, I really let him know that I was tired of being lied to and I was tired of being treated like a second-class citizen that I had been a police officer for so many years, just like him, and that uh, this was all BS. He became angry, told me to leave his park and never to return and to remain silent, and I left and I came back home. In a conclusion of this, uh, there were other consequences later I had to face my peers back home I had to speak with my sheriff 
very fortunate that I had a sheriff who was not only my supervisor and person that I respected, but it was actually a man that I too had hunted with and we had bear hunted and we had deer hunted all over the state of Tennessee and Ohio and other places. And we had been in camps and we had all killed bear and we knew what a bear looked like. And I look back over the years and if I sound a little bit angry or if I sound a little bit upset is because I just, I'm, I'm upset because I know that authorities know what runs these hills and woods and I understand that there are people's lives in jeopardy and something, something has to be done or something has, should be done and I, I just wish more people would understand with all the deaths and killings that we've had throughout Kentucky and throughout the state of Tennessee, whether if it is in Cock County or if it's up in uh, the, our sister state or brother state of Kentucky, no matter where it's at, when they concoct the stories of that it's all some unknown wild animal, it is my feelings and belief the authorities know exactly what animal that it is. And um, that's that's what I want. I want to make that quite clear to people to be careful in the woods and and to be safe. There's things out there that we don't understand. Right. So, Martin, can you tell us and the viewers how your encounter affected you and your hunting partner, partner Harry? It ruined both of us, and it 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 destroyed me. My hunting partner uh, never fully recovered. And in fact, when he got back home, we discovered that the encounter had done something to him that he in fact had suffered a stroke and he was never the same. And he did in fact resign and retire and quit uh, being a policeman altogether. And uh, over the years I'd kept in touch with him and he had he had had some physical uh, issues for the rest of his life and now has passed away. And for me personally, it, it destroyed me. I never looked at the woods the same way and I still don't now. And to be honest with you, if my wife was here, she would tell you She would tell you how much I have suffered with the encounter and how I relive it every day. I kept this a secret from her for years. She thought it was just because of what I did for a living, but I would wake up during the nights and and uh, suffer from, from nightmares or shock from what I still relive and what I see and cannot accept. And... Uh, it it I still to this day I, I still have the issues but in any event I I kept all these things secret and hidden and what brought it forth I'm if I may tell this what brought it forth was was an individual and then I am so glad to have have his his beautiful children with us here tonight but Mr. Johnny Henderson and Elijah began to speak with me on social media because they had seen basically I had posted some things and asked some asked some questions in a uh, paranormal Bigfoot group and Elijah had approached me and Henderson Johnny Henderson had approached me and wanted to know what I'd seen and what I'd heard and uh, eventually I did break down and tell them more I was at first I wasn't scared to talk with them of course because I didn't know Johnny and Elijah. And the more that I got to know how honorable of a man Johnny Henderson was, and to the day that God rest his soul, he has passed away, he kept that secret. And he never told my name, he kept it secret. And I still didn't, didn't want to come out and tell anyone, but I got a phone call and I was contacted by Elijah and Elijah thought I should come forward with my story. And the one thing that also changed is that I 
my hunting partner had passed away. And uh, a week before he had died, we had met. And he had told me that as long as I kept his, his uh, name and his family clear from any ridicule, any, any type of public uh, uh, where they could not come back on his family because he knew he was dying. And so I came forth. And uh, when I came forth, I told the story and we, we sat down and, and spoke with Seth Breedlove and Small Town Monsters Group and Heather Moser. And I disclosed my story for the very first time. And um, that's how the story came to be. Well, we're so glad that Elijah and Johnny talked to you into coming out and telling everybody because this is something that people need to know that's going on here. So let me ask you this, Martin. How has uh, how is your experience affecting you today, 30 years later? Does it affect you at all? Are you having any repercussions of coming coming forward and going public with your story being a... 30-year police officer? Mentally, it, it's still, I had been told that it would make it easier for me, and I have discovered that it has not. I have good days and I have bad days, and that's mentally. But as far as how has it affect, affected my life, I've had some things take place since I have come forward, and I have been contacted by a government official that has let me know that they were displeased with the fact that I had come forward and had written a book. Uh, and that's, that's basically all I should say about that and kind of let it go. But I've been contacted. They've let me know what they thought of it. And I have let them know that I will not be silenced and that uh, I will continue to try to discover answers. Now, one thing I would like to make public that I have not spoken of and that the fact is, and I've kept this quiet, I've never sought any public notoriety. I've never wanted to have my intentions or my name known. But since 1993, I have had a, a, a quest per se to seek and search for answers. And I have silently, since 1993, I have interviewed countless amounts of local witnesses from Grand Rivers, from Kentucky, from Dover, Tennessee, and I, I honestly cannot tell you how many people that I have spoken to that have wanted to remain anonymous because of the clear public ridicule. I mean, these are people, these are people that sit on the church pews on a Sunday that they know if they come forward and they tell what they've seen or they tell their encounter that they're going to be laughed out of out of the church or if they're you know have a public business that the ridicule will be so strong that they might even in fact have to leave the area that they have uh, uh, been living in all their life and uh, I've led many expeditions in the land between the lakes to seek and find answers. It's not that I ever want to see or have another encounter. I'm seeking evidence. I'm seeking tracks. I'm, I'm seeking hair samples. I want to know what is in the woods. I want to find out and discover. And I have investigated countless amounts of deaths in the area that have been kept quiet and kept silent. And uh, so, there's been a lot of uh, things that has occurred and happened in the last, uh, especially the last 20, 25 years. There's been so many deaths and attacks. Right. And uh, so that's that's another thing I wanted to bring forward that this hasn't stopped. It continues to to occur. There's been other deaths in land between the lakes as recent as 2020 when we had someone that disappeared and I, I've been told not to talk about it because it is an official open case of two missing persons and uh, so if this still is occurring and is still taking place in this area why isn't there more law enforcement and why isn't there more public recognition there is danger whether if it is in land between the lakes or 
the same occurrences in our national parks that take place. Right. So everybody's looking for answers, Martin, and uh, I think we're going to have some coming up real soon. So can you tell the viewers what the name of your book is and how they can uh, get a hold of the book and read it? The, na the name of the book that we wrote about the encounter, the encounter is Beast Between the Rivers. And it is a short read, but it's factual to just the bare bones of telling of the story and the counter and the purpose of the book was to give public awareness. The second book will drop very soon and it will be A Trace of Death is the name of the book. And A Trace of Death will go in depth uh, more about some missing persons and some occurrences and deaths within the park. And it will also tell of an encounter that I won't speak of tonight, but something that occurred with myself and another researcher on uh, an encounter. We, we had an expedition on October the 19th in Land Between the Lakes in a secluded area, and we had another encounter. We weren't seeking an encounter. We were seeking for evidence. And to our un fate of unlucky state, unlucky state, we actually had a encounter with a being, and uh, we'll talk about that at a, at a, after the book comes out, but it sure. will be pretty intense, and I think the second book will be as good as the first, and I encourage, if you want to get answers and you want to know what is taking place in our national parks and in, in an area such as our recreation center here at uh, Land Between the Lakes, uh, read both the books. Highly recommended by myself. And uh, I want to thank everybody for watching this video. If you like the content, please consider subscribing to the channel. And Martin, I want to thank you for your honesty and your bravery. Thank you, Bart. Thank you for coming forward, Great brother. Great to be here with you tonight. It's great to have and you Land here. Between the Lakes. Right. And this is only the first of several videos that will be coming up concerning this area so you guys have a great night and thanks for stopping by thanks for watching the show